divinity decided to clothe himself in humanity and be birthed in the earth through immaculate conception. Miracle. Regardless of your origin story, if your parents were married or they were just having fun, whether you were planned or you think that you are a mistake, you were planned by God. You may not be able to swim right now, but you started off swimming. Millions of sperm didn't make it. Attorney David say, but I'm the one who made it. That's the real deal. You made your way through a canal and you were the first one to get in that egg and then that egg was able to become a embryo and then it planted itself upon the uterine wall and for nine months or maybe eight months, maybe you were born premature, but you made it. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, I made it? <laughs> you could have been aborted, but you made it. Of course, you've gone through pain and trouble and trial and adversity, but it's really just a sign that you are marked by God. Because, Pastor Chuck, a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. So is there anyone here in this room like me? You can say, I've been through the fire. I've been through some storms. Just the fact that I made it here alive is a testimony. The fact that according to, according to statistics, as a black man, I should either be in jail or dead or crazy, but I'm still here. I'm, I'm still here. When my, when my great, great, great grandparents made it through the Middle Passage, I'm still here in the middle of civil rights and Jim Crow. I'm still here in the middle of COVID-19 and the disparities and the challenges that happened, and I'm still here. Turn to your neighbor and say, while I'm, since I'm still here, since I'm still here, I might as well give God praise. Since I'm still here, it must mean that there's something that he wants me to do. Since I'm still here, I might as well use what I got. Since I'm still here and I'm a miracle, I might as well sign up to be a miracle worker. Since I'm still here, I might as well give God praise because praise is a weapon. The enemy tried to stop your praise. The enemy tried to kill you before you were even born, but since you're here, you might as well. I dare 30 people and a baby. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to get caught. I'm still here. And I don't look like what I've been through. I've gone through the fire and I don't even smell like smoke. I've gone through difficulties and I'm still here. Through many dangers, toils and snares, here I am. And while I'm, I started from the bottom, but now I'm here. And since I'm here. Sheena, you're here, man. You're still here, man. But by the grace of God, and since you're still here. Come up. Come stand behind him, Ken. Come stand behind him. Come here, come here, Sheena, quickly. Come stand here, raise your hands. 
you got to get here on the 24th. The 24th, we're having a good old-fashioned miracle service, and we're going to be praying. This man of God is going to be laying hands on people who have cancer because if you didn't see his testimony, the, the, the devil tried it, but God said no. God said no. I got too much work for you to do. I got an assignment for you to do. I got books I need you to write. I need you to be a leader among leaders. Come face me. Face me, Sheena. Put your, put your hands. Face me. Come stand behind him, Ken. Come stand behind him. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. And Father, we release right now Jehovah Rapha you've already worked in his body cancer has to go every single form of cancer has to leave his body you're adding years to his life and life to his years and father the chemotherapy will not affect his heart or his liver or his kidneys or any other of his vital organs father may Jehovah Rapha the healing nurture and power of God rest upon him now cancer you are gone you are defeated you have no authority and we thank you Lord that since Sheena is still here since he's still alive father he'll give you praise and father he's gonna lay hands on others and they will receive the victory I'm still I dare somebody to say to say I'm still what did the devil try to do to you what was your diagnosis what was your story I got a testimony I got a story I got it I'm still still here and I'm still here because yeah this is my first point I didn't even get to the text but uh, just turn to John chapter 9 Sheena make sure you're here on the 24th so I'm gonna need you to lay hands on those who have battled cancer and the cancer is going to dry up John chapter 9, verse number 13. You've already done your homework. Raise your hand if you did your homework. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you did your homework. What was the homework? Anyone know what the homework was last week? What were you supposed to read? The whole chapter, John chapter 9. Uh, we see that Jesus, uh, his disciples ask a question. Uh, why is this man blind? Uh, who sinned? Is his mother sin? Did he sin? What's the deal? And Jesus looks at the disciples and he pretty much says, shut up. He says, mind your business. You're acting like you care, but you really don't care. Be careful of people that try to act like they care, but they really don't care. Have you ever, anyone ever ask you, how are you doing today? And then you go to answer them and you can tell as you're answering, they really don't care. Why are you even asking me? If you don't want to know, you don't really care. And Jesus is pretty much saying, listen, there are a lot of people that are always trying to figure out why is this person sick? Or why is this person? I wonder why he's at the altar. I wonder what happened to him. I wonder why he's crying. I wonder why he's blind. And all of these people in John chapter 9 verse 1 through 12, are asking Jesus, why is this man blind? Did he sin? Did his mother sin? And Jesus is like, you guys are looking at the wrong thing and you're asking the wrong question. Jesus never went up to him, Katani, and said, well, uh, um, uh, do you go to Jubilee? Uh, do you, uh, uh, are you going to tithe? Uh, are you a member of my church? Uh, will you sign up for this new opportunity? Uh, he didn't do any of that uh, because Jesus, hear me, and the old mothers used to say this Jesus saw beyond his condition he saw beyond his fault and he saw his need and I'm here just to encourage someone if you're here in this room it doesn't matter whatever mistakes you've made it doesn't matter I don't know if it was your mommy I don't know if it was your daddy I don't know what generational curse that's tried to come against you if you're here in this room turn to your neighbor and say if you're here in this room you are now qualified to receive a miracle. 
the qualification for the miracle is just showing up the qualifications for the miracle is that you know the miracle worker who can do something that you cannot do on your own if you can do it on your own you would do it but the fact that you need a miracle and you step into the house of miracles the fact that you need a miracle and you step into the house of prayer I'm excited that Jesus didn't go up to the man and say well you gotta go to school first and you gotta be baptized first and you gotta complete this class first and you gotta know the books of the bibles first no Jesus didn't say any of that he just spit on the dirt put mud in his eyes and said go to the pool of shalom wash your eyes and you'll be able to see why because Jesus is not just concerned about your ability to see physically but he wants you to see with your heart So the questions we asked last week is, can you see? Turn your neighbor and say, can you see? Because if you could see, then you wouldn't complain the way you complain. This man couldn't see. Ken, he, he didn't know. So in John chapter 9, look at me in verse number 18. Sorry, look at verse number 17. Finally, after they've questioned him, they questioned his parents, they've questioned every person that could possibly figure out why this man could see now and why Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. <laughs> Isn't it interesting, Maddie, that... At, in verse number 17, he could see, but they were still calling him blind. Because his eyes were opened in verse number 8. But in verse number 17, finally, they turned again to the blind man. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not blind. <laughs> I'm not blind no more. <laughs> I can see. And finally, they turn. Isn't it interesting how people will label you and they will try to get you to remain your old self, your old way, your old mistakes? And but they, they're still calling him a blind man. But he didn't even care. They, 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 they said to the blind man, what have you to say about him? This is the first time that he's going to say something about Jesus. And he says, it was your eyes that he opened. And the man replied, he is a prophet. First question is, can you see? The second thing is, turn to your neighbor and say, he is a prophet have to see this give me a second I'll come back if you stay with me I'm gonna <laughs> Jesus is turn to your neighbor and say he is, our he is our savior but sometimes because he is your savior you only see him as your superman And of course, if you're in trouble and you call on Superman, he's going to come. But eventually, Mother Diane, he's going to be like, do you see me any other way besides just a savior? Of course, I'm going to save you. Of course. I love you. But I'm not just your savior. I'm also your Lord. He's a savior. He's our Lord. We sing it. He's our savior. He's our Lord. And he's our God. He's a savior. He's a Lord. He's our king. You have to know him as savior, as Lord, and as king. But not only is he your savior, Lord, and king, but he is a prophet. The thing that makes me so excited about that, Pastor Josh, is that and me and Maddie were talking about this the other day, that there are people that have the gift of the word of knowledge. And when you have the gift of the word of knowledge, it means that the Lord can show you 
things that have happened in the past. And the past meets the present. But prophecy is when the Lord gives you the ability to speak into your future. So can you turn to your neighbor and say, you are a prophet. Now, you may not hold the office of a prophet. You may not be like Prophet Gideon Danzo. You may not be able to have all of the other gifts, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the word of revelation. But everybody in this room has the ability to prophesy. I'm, I'm going to have you prophesy right now. Look to your neighbor and say, I can see you, can see you. In, your in your future. And you look much better, you look much better. than you look, right now. you look right now. Turn to them and say, you look good right now, you look good right now. but you're going to look even better. You want to prophesy again? Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm about to prophesy. <laughs> to you. Your latter, your latter days will be greater, will be greater than your former, days. Your former days. You, you are, about to are about to walk into, walk into a, new a new season of blessing. Of blessing. Now, if you believe it, you receive it. Turn to neighbor and say, I like this prophecy. I like this. I like this. I like this. So, Kevin, he is our savior, but you can't be someone's savior. He is our Lord. You can't be someone's Lord. He's our king. Well, in England, that's a whole other conversation, but you can't be someone's king. But you can be someone's prophet. Jesus, the anointing of God, Chuck, is inside of you. So the Lord has given you the ability to see beyond what you can see. And if you can see it, if you see something, say something. It happens all the time in the Bible. There's someone that is Gideon is hiding in a wine press, hiding from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord comes to him and he sees Gideon in his future. And he says, you are a mighty warrior. Turn your neighbor and say, you are... A mighty warrior. You're stronger than you think. <laughs> You've gone through so many tests and so many trials and you're still here. You're stronger than you think. So, so even in the Old Testament, the anointing of prophecy released something in Gideon. The Lord shows up at a burning bush and says to Moses, I've heard the cries of my people and the Egyptians have been placing my people in enslavement for 400 years. I've heard the cries of your ancestors and your grandmothers and your great grandmothers and now I am sending you to go to Pharaoh church. The Lord is sending you to go to your college campus. The Lord is sending you back to your neighborhood the Lord is sending you to the halls of government just like he spoke to Moses and he says go to Pharaoh and say Pharaoh let my people because the Lord saw something in Moses that he didn't see in himself Moses actually starts to contend with the Lord like not me I I just st stutter and and I got too many problems. Can't you choose somebody else? Because he, the Lord sees 
something in your future and he has to speak it into existence. I went Old Testament on those two. Let me go New Testament. There's a man by the name of Saul who had been persecuting Christians throughout the book of Acts. And one day, Saul is on his way to the Damascus Road to persecute more Christians. He had already been a part of the plot to behead and kill Stephen. And now he's on his way to Damascus. And a light from heaven shines, knocks him off his horse, and he hears a voice. Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in the next few chapters, Paul is standing, delivering, preaching, declaring. In the book of Rome, Romans, he pins, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power. Because he's not just a savior. He's not just your Lord. He's not just your king. But he's a prophet. I want to release the anointing of prophecy in this house. It's the miracle of the prophetic. It's the miracle that you, you can't be someone's savior or lord or king, but you can prophesy. Every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you just to lay your hands, I want you to lay your hands on your mouth. You are about to walk in a season where the reason why it's so important for you to answer what you see is because many times you pray what you see. Or you complain based upon what you see. But your eyes of the spirit are about to be opened so that you can prophesy. So that you can speak to every mountain, you can speak to every stronghold. You can stand in the gap and say, I'm not leaving here. I will not stop praying until I see it. Could it be that the enemy is not always just concerned about your ability to see, but he's trying to keep you quiet? And this man couldn't see, but he still said, he is a prophet. And in chapter 9, verse number 25, after they questioned him some more, he said, I don't care about what any of you guys say. All I know is that I once was blind. And now I see. And now that I can see, I'm going to open my mouth and I'm going to say something. Because nothing happens in the kingdom until something said to father as these have their hands on their mouth right now we untie their tongue we thank you that you've placed your word within them the word of faith the word of prophecy the word of hope the word of encouragement the word of joy the word of peace the word of prayer you placed it. Not only are they miracles, but they are miracle workers. And Father, the miracle is that they can speak to their family. They can speak to a dry place. They can speak to a, they can speak to their bills, their debt, and add discipline. 
faith and see you move mountains. You've done it before. We believe that you'll do it again. Now every t everyone take your hand off your mouth and just, just raise your hands like this. Well, every head is bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you're here in this room and you're saying, Pastor, if I died today, I honestly don't know where I would spend eternity. I don't know if I'd go to heaven or hell. And, and I just want to know. I just, I, I want to be sure. I don't want to die uncertain. And God is your Savior. He's your Lord. He's your king. He's your prophet. He's your redeemer. He knows you. He understands you. And he loves you. And so while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're here in this room, the greatest miracle in all of, in all of the world is the miracle of salvation. So if you're here and you've never prayed the prayer of salvation, but you want to give your life to Jesus, just raise that hand real high. Raise it high in the air. God bless you. I see that hand. My sister, I see that hand, my daughter. Raise it high so I can see. You can put your hand down. Maybe you're here and you're saying, Pastor, I used to be saved, but I've fallen away. I'm in a backslidden position, but I want to I want to come back home. I want to get right with God. If that's you, raise that hand. Raise your hand high. Let me see. I see that hand all the way in the back. God bless you. I see that hand, my daughter. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. He loves you. He understands you. He knows you. He's not mad at you. He's not holding anything against you. The only qualification for the miracle is that you're here. And you, you respond to his knocking at the door of your heart. There are some of you right now, you're, you're feeling like this, this knocking, this heat kind of in your, in your chest. That's, that's, that's God. That's Jesus knocking at the door of your heart. And so maybe you're here and you're just confused. You don't know if you were saved, if you ever were saved. You just, you don't know. But you want, you want something called salvation assurance. If that's you, raise your hand. I want to pray with you. I want to lead you in the time of prayer. If you lifted your hand for prayer on any three of those invitations, don't worry about anyone else. I want you to stand right now. Stand to your feet right now. Just stand up. Just stand right up. If you lifted your hand for prayer on any three of those invitations, just stand to your feet right now. Thank you. Thank you. He's here. He's here. He's here. You can take all this world. <laughs> you can take all this world. Give me Jesus. For those of you that are standing, can you do me a favor? Can you grab your Bible, your phone, your belongings, and just step out of the aisle and just come right here to the front? I want to pray with you. Take all this world. You can take all this world give me jesus come on jubilee put your hands together for these i want jesus come on this is somebody's daughter somebody's sister take all this world you can take all this world give me come on don't stop clapping jubilee this is this is the miracle come on this is a miracle you can take all this world take all this world you can take all this world give me jesus i want i want jesus now before i invite some of the altar workers to come you may be here and you were afraid to raise your hand or perhaps you were afraid to stand but you know that you should be here. I want to wait for you because somebody, somebody waited for me. Somebody prayed for me. Someone stood in the gap for me. 
if you know that you should be here um, and if you died today you don't know where you'd spend eternity I want to give you another opportunity to just respond to the to the call that Jesus is making to you right now you can take all this world take all this world you can take all this world give me Jesus I'm going to ask if some of the deacons and some of the altar workers if you can come God bless you God bless you and I'm satisfied with the well that won't run dry give me Jesus come on Julie if we're going to clap let's do it let's Let's praise God for the miracle, for the miracle of salvation. He's a miracle worker. For those of you that are at the altar, for those of you at the altar, can, can, you, can you look at me? Can you look at me? You've made the smartest decision you could ever make. It's the decision to give your life to the one who created you. Before the very foundations of the earth, he knew you. Jeremiah 1 says that before you were in your mother's womb or in your father's loins, he knew you. And he set you apart to be a prophet to the nations. To speak into the earth. To be an example. To be an ambassador. And so you made the smartest decision. And that's the decision to give your life to the one who made you. Who created you. Imagine with me for a second that you were an inventor and you invented the microphone. And you invented the microphone so that you could stand on a stage and amplify sound and thousands of people could hear you sing or you preach or you deliver a a message. And you're the inventor of the microphone. You have all of the patents get it all mapped out and you have it it's done and it works and you happen to go to a boys and girls club and you go into the gym and you see a bunch of kids using a microphone as a basketball throwing shooting it in a hoop as the inventor you'd be like hey stop that's not why I created the microphone I didn't create it for you to bounce it it doesn't bounce I didn't create it to throw it in the hoop I didn't create it for you to kick it around I'm the inventor I I create I know why I created it and could it be that the creator of the heavens and the earth is looking over the corridors of your life and he's saying wait a minute It's not why I created her. It's not why I created him. It's not, that's not the dream that I have for for him or for her. And as the creator, as the inventor, he's he's standing at the corner of heaven saying, wait, wait, wait. Don't, Don't. Don't allow the world to use you that way. And so the smartest thing you could do was surrender and say, okay, you know, Lord, you made me, you created me. Lord, can you remake me? I, I, I surrender. I, I repent. Lord, I, forgive me. I need you. And that's all you're about to do right now. Just raise your hands like this. When you raise your hands, you're saying, Lord, I surrender. I I repent. I let it go. And when you raise your hands like this, you're in a posture not only to let it go, but you're in a posture to receive all that God has for you. And I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. And I'm not going to lie to you. After you pray this prayer, your life's not going to be perfect. You're still going to go through troubles and trials and adversity. But as long as you stay on his team, you will win. And as a church, our responsibility is to teach you how to stay on his team 
so you can win. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, dear Lord. That's right. Let's say it together. Say, dear Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for me. I admit that I'm a sinner, and I acknowledge that I need your help. I believe that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for me, and I believe that on the third day, he rose again with all power in his hands. I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart, Christ is my King, my Lord, my Savior, and the prophet that is speaking to my future. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Father, we cover these now. We thank you, Lord, that these are surrendered to you. They're not perfect, but they're surrendered. And you have taken all of their sin, all of their shame, and you've thrown it in the sea of forgetfulness, and you are giving them an opportunity to begin again. Strengthen them today in Jesus' name. Jubilee, can you put your hands together for these? Come on, let, let's, let's worship God with them and praise God. You are forgiven. You are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come.